Welcome to, I don't know what number we're up to, but something like the fourth, fifth talk? I'm not sure where we're up to. But this one is going to be about smart motorways. Now, initially, when I started doing these, my ambition was to make this part of our observer training. And one of the modules, obviously, is on dual carriageways and motorways. And that's how it started off. And when I realized I'd got about an hour and a half material <laughs> on this one and only half an hour to fill, I decided I was going to make it smart motorways only because most of us know a certain amount about motorways, but smart motorways and in all of their var variations and vagaries are relatively new. And there's a few things I wanted to talk about with those. Actually, I've subtitled this one. So it's smart motorways and the mystery of the broken red cross. That's obviously just to keep your attention, really. So what is the mystery of the broken red cross? All will be revealed. No shouting out from anybody in Durham. Brief introduction, just because I do this every time and most of you are probably bored with it by now. But my name's David Reeves. I'm look after observer training here at North Ants Advanced Drivers. I used to be an IT consultant and used to do lots of training uh, amongst other things. And having been made redundant a couple of years ago, I trained as an ADI, but I've never actually worked as an ADI. But I do all sorts of other voluntary things. I, I, when we're not locked down, I help out in a primary school. I'm now a governor there. I'm also a JP here in Northampton. What about motorways? 60 plus years old, safer, higher speeds. No, this is not a continuation of the introduction. That's not me. I'm talking about motorways. 1959, obviously memorable for two reasons. One of them was that uh, it was the first opening of the motorway. As you can clearly see, that's the, you recognize it straight away, that's the M1 near Luton. I came up there yesterday. It has changed a little bit, but the lane drill really hasn't changed at all, really. You know, you're still allowed to drive for miles in the outside lane, should you want to. They're generally safer, but they involve higher speeds. So there are certain things we have to consider. Now, <clears throat> while the M, well, actually the uh, Preston Bypass, I think was the very first motorway, but the first full size one was the M1 and it was opened in 1959 uh, by Ernest Sharples. Now, if you tuned your car radio in on that occasion, you might have hit the, heard the number one hit of the time on the top of the hit parade, which was somebody called Cliff Richard uh, with a hit called Under Shadows with a travelling light. And Macmillan was prime minister at the time. I remember it all well. But as you see, there's... The motorway network has really expanded greatly over the last few years. Oh, well, since then, in the last few years, last 60 years. All these thin blue lines are conventional motorways. But gradually, all these thicker blue ones, M25, bottom of the M1, M1 past us, all that section of the M6 past Birmingham, are gradually changing into smart motorways of one sort or another and that's why it's important all the red bits are smart motorways that are being constructed at the moment so this is going to be quite important in fact if you live here in Northampton very shortly smart motorways will be the only ones you're able to use not that there's any real choice same on some of the urban common conurbations like Birmingham. Similarly, once you get up towards Manchester. So we need to really have a look at these. Now, before we do that, I said that they're safer. Well, actually, that, that is, seems to be official. There was an international report by um, International Traffic Data and something else group, this, um, this group here, IRTAD, which actually in 2018, when you actually analyze deaths per miles per car driven and so on, we actually came up, UK or actually England, because a lot of these statistics are done country by, uh, separately for each region now. But England 
came out top uh higher than germany higher than france higher than finland and all those ones we boast about for motorway fatalities highways england and apologize for anybody in scotland or wales but i got a lot of my figures from highways england because five or so years ago what used to be the highways agency got broken up into highways england um i think it's transport scotland and the welsh government for the welsh bits so um, I've mainly looked at the statistics from Highways England. Now they've what they call normalised their figures, but basically, if the score for safety fatalities was one, um, fatalities on A roads are three point five. So for every one death on a motorway, that for the same sort of miles driven, there'll be three and a half deaths on a on an A road. It's more dramatic if you look, split the A roads out into dual carriageways and single carriageway roads where it's something like double for a dual carriageway and something like four or five times for an ordinary A road. <clears throat> so there's no doubt about it. Generally speaking, motorways are safer. Now, we're all used to conventional motorways and I haven't dwelt on this because in the IM most people are familiar with motorways they're usually okay some people get nervous about joining motorways on the slip road and once we've got over that problem um, it's not too bad most people drive too close again if we encourage them to leave a long gap and look a bit further ahead everything's fine so I'm not going to dwell on that today but we are used to conventional motorways two or three lanes hard shoulder, slip road on, slip road off. It's very straightforward, as I say, been around for 60 odd years. But what about smart motorways? This is a picture I took just two or three miles away from where I live. This is the M1, a smart section, four lanes, no hard shoulder, but there are these laybys every now and again called ERAs, emergency refuge areas, and there's a sign for one it's down there you can just about make it out where that pointer is so what about this this is what i'm going to concentrate on now as soon as you talk about this well first of all why are we having these there seems to be a rash of them as we saw they're they're kind of taking over the network particularly at busy places and and uh, urban conurbations and so on well why because they improve traffic flow and they add an extra lane we've now got four lanes and how do they do it well they're adding capacity obviously they're removing the hard shoulder and creating extra running lane. so there's the physical volume of the road space if you will but it's also managed it's also got variable speed limit so it controls the flow of the traffic along there why do we do it because it's cheaper it would be much, much more expensive to really widen the motorways and add another lane and in addition to a hard shoulder. It's all about cost in the end. This is an economic way of doing it. So this is the reason why, and to some extent, they work. Now, if you listen to politicians or people discussing this, they will say these have been around for a long time. But actually, it's not slightly disingenuous because they've changed over the years way back late 80s there was something called ramp metering this is something that started in the states apparently this is effectively putting some control type traffic lights on slip roads so it controls how many vehicles join the motorway and that there was one in walsall i think there was a couple in, in birmingham sort of area so that rather than have a a pinch point where a lot of traffic joined the motorway they would control the flow of traffic onto it and, and limit it in some way then of course the m25 round london has had variable mandatory speed limits for a long time conventional motorway but it has those variable speed limits to try and control the flow and slow down traffic on approach to some pinch point or a hold up then same sort of thing happened with the M42 south of Birmingham, but this became a kind of test bed for what's going to become smart motorways. So controlled motorway, they call, were called then, M42, 
And eventually, in 2005, they tried out the idea of a dynamic hard shoulder. In other words, some of the time, the hard shoulder could be used as a running lane, but then switched off again, reverting back to a hard shoulder uh, at non-peak times. Now, these have been known by various names. Active traffic management or, or managed motorways were two of the variants on this over the years. But probably since about 2013 or so, all of these variants have now been called smart motorways. So we really need to know what we're talking about with these. And they come in a few different flavors. So what are the flavors of smart motorways? First of all, there were the controlled motorways. And there's still quite a few of those around. And there are sections that are controlled motorways. Um, I'm going to look at them in detail in a moment. Then there's all ALRs, all lanes running. That's what we often think of smart motorways. And then there's dynamic hard shoulders, where the hard shoulder is switched in and out of service. So let's have a look at these in a little bit more detail. Controlled motorways, these have been around, as we said, I've just said, for a little while now. And they retain the hard shoulder. The hard shoulder stays there permanently as a, as a hard shoulder. So there's somewhere to break down on, there's somewhere for emergency vehicles to gain access to an incident should it occur. But these red circles are mandatory speed limits. In fact, all of these gantries now are fitted with cameras and it's a nice little earner. There's a regular supply of people clocking these things because it's, it's fairly automatic. More of that in a moment. But we're all kind of used to that. Now, the idea of these is that on an approach to an incident, you can manage the speed. That basically means changing the speed limit from the default 70 miles an hour down to usually 60 or 50. And that means that you can slow the traffic down if it's coming to a point that usually causes traffic jams. Obviously, like here, they can be even slower. If there's an actual incident, it can be used to slow the traffic down even further. Um, so that's what that's about. One of its effects is, I think we've all experienced it over the years, is that shockwave effect where the traffic slows down for some reason up ahead but a shockwave moves backwards through the traffic and so the traffic behind it comes to a grinding halt and then gets going again and then comes to another grinding halt well the idea of managing it of damping down the the flow rate is to is to try and stop that and that's quite successful and it it also limits the number of rear end shunts and things that uh, often as a result of that sort of um, traffic behaviour of sudden stops. Now we come to all lane running, and this is what we tend to mean by smart motorways. And we're, this is a diagram that came from, from um, Highways England, and it describes what a smart motorway should look like. So what we're seeing is extra signage to let you know what's going on with the smart motorway, any incidents, anything like this. Instead of a hard shoulder, we now get this lay-by thing, an emergency area or an emergency refuge area with a, with a phone in it, with a SOS type phone in there. There will be many more gantries because they have signs above them that tell you whether the lane is open or closed or whether we need to change lanes and things like this. And along with the signals, there are now CCTV cameras to a central regional control room. Of course, we have the extra lane here, extra signage, as we said. They're also putting in traffic monitoring systems. The cameras themselves can detect the flow of traffic, how fast it's going, is it slowing up or something like this. Um, but this traffic monitoring radar that's coming in is a bit like the stuff that they use at airfields for monitoring aircraft on the ground. So as they t places like Heathrow where it gets busy, they can see in fog. Now this can detect more easily stationary vehicles 
or objects on the carriageway. Uh, and that's gradually coming in as well. The ordinary cameras apparently were less good at detecting the difference between an empty motorway and a completely stationary motorway. Uh, well, I think they've got around that problem now. Now, because of all this other technology, there's also massive great ducts under the ground along the side of it, which is why it takes so long to, to construct these things for all the extra cabling and so on that's necessary uh, and all the monitoring um, hardware and software and so on that goes with this. So that's basically what they're creating in an all lane running version of a smart motorway. The third variant is what we talked about, the dynamic hard shoulder. So this is where the hard shoulder can be switched in and out of operation. So here we are, dynamic hard shoulder. It's got a solid white line down it because it's a hard shoulder some of the time. But can we use this at the moment? In, the, in this picture, can I use this hard shoulder to run along? Yeah, nobody is. Uh, but it's got a speed limit sign above the top of it. Whenever you can use this, it tends to be at peak times, there will be a speed limit displayed above the top of it. What about now? No signs lit at all. Can I use it? No, you can't. Uh, and sure enough, nobody is using it mainly because I photoshopped the sign, gantry signs onto them after the, uh, after the event. But what about this red cross in there? Ah. Or what about this? Hang on. Isn't that another red cross? Ah, the mystery of the broken red cross. Remember that? Here's the broken red cross. And if you're as anarchic as I have been this week and looked it up, you'll find that in the signs manual that the government publishes, these have two different numbers. So there's the broken one and there's the solid one. Mm, the mystery thickens. What could possibly be the difference between those two? Well, just to make sure people hang on till the end, I'm not going to do the big reveal for a while yet. But I'll just leave you with that, the mystery of the broken red cross. So dynamic hard shoulder. Sometimes it works as a hard shoulder. So if it just as you can normally on a normal motorway, you can stop on it if it's an emergency. If you break down and, there's a, and the regulations list what sort of emergencies you can use. Can you drive along it? Nah, nah you've never been allowed to drive along it. That's against the law. Um, but you can break down on it. You are allowed to do that. That's, that's fine. And most people, if you're in the act of breaking down, I think it would be a bit harsh if you actually got a penalty for that fund, if you were just doing that, or indeed regaining the carriageway. Oh, I forgot to mention this bit as well. Very often it will have an additional message saying hard shoulder emergency use only as a reminder. Right. The concern everybody mentions straight away when people talk about it is this business of a lack of hard shoulder and smart motorways. Is it safe? Is it safe? And these are the concerns people tend to have. What happens if you break down or there's, you know, a minor collision, one of these shunts or something and you're meant to exchange details and all those sorts of things. What happens if you have a fairly common breakdown with a puncture or mechanical failure? Now, at the moment, according to the RAC, they repair on the hard shoulder 75%. They can repair there and then, and the car goes off and so on. It's fixed. But what about now when it's happening in the main carriageway and there isn't a hard shoulder? How do the breakdown services deal with this and what do they do? And for that matter, if you have got into one of these laybys, how do you get out of it again? Anybody who's pulled out of a layby on a fast dual carriageway knows how kind of scary and difficult that can be. So these are some of the common things that people are concerned with. And then there's 
Well, one of the reasons for having the hard shoulder was emergency access. Ambulances, police, fire crew getting to an incident. Now, how on earth do they do that if there's four lanes of solid traffic? And it's all very well closing a lane, but if people ignore it because all they can see is a beautifully clear lane and everything else is chocker, people tend to ignore the closed Red Cross lanes. And when they've limited the speed somewhat, say down to 50 or 60, and all the traffic in all four lanes is doing the same speed, the lane discipline completely breaks down. People overtake all over the place, people weave in and out of the traffic, all sorts of things. So people quite rightly have a number of concerns about this. And then there's the sort of lane one avoidance club. Because sometimes it's a hard shoulder and sometimes it isn't and all sorts of features, you can go on long stretch. I, I get this fairly regularly when I go up to see my elderly mother in a nursing home in Shropshire, all past Birmingham, there's like a club that avoids lane one. All three lanes, three other lanes can be chock-a-block, but lane one will be empty. It's quite bizarre. Um, possibly, because we keep switching in and out of lane one being used for an exit for a particular junction, or it's dynamic hard shoulder for some of the way, and some people are not quite sure whether it's running or not, so they avoid it. Not quite sure why. So are they safe? What's the official view? Well, the official view, according to the Department for Transport, is they are. Again, a normalised figure. So if an ordinary motorway is rated 100 for safety, some arbitrary unit, smart motorways are rated 82. So officially, they're safer. Um, uh, it does a number of things. It reduces the sudden changes in speed that we've seen, and it reduces, therefore, some of the accidents, or at least the severity of some of the uh, accidents that are related to that, things like tailgating, loss of control that are related to speed, because at the end of the day, the only real control is speed. And the better management means you get a better flow, not the, not the waves of high speed, low speed sort of thing. However, reading through the report, it's got a few questionable assumptions. Uh, oh, the one I liked before I move on was fewer illegal stops on the hard shoulder was in the report. Well, of course it has. There's no hard shoulder. How can you stop on it? Uh, mm, at this point, there were some dodgy assumptions I decided. Unsafe lane changes, motorcycles weaving, and uh, reversing on a slip road. I thought, well, how on earth does a smart way to prevent that? The only reason I can think is, well, if it's flowing better, why would you reverse on a slip road? It might be because you join the slip road only to realize it's stationary and then try reversing up the motorway, up the slip road again. Not sure. And it says, because everybody's traveling at more or less the same speed, there are less moving vehicle collisions. Those are the assumptions that are made. But the official guidance does say that some very specific risks go up and they go up massively. One of them, the first one, is a vehicle stopping in a running lane. And actually they break it into it peak times and off peak times. Which ones do you think is more dangerous? Peak time or off peak? Actually it's off peak. Because the th assumption is that at peak times, there's loads of traffic. If somebody breaks down in one of the lanes, somebody will dial 999. There's more people to see it and react to it early. And it tends to, the traffic will stop or there'll be a, a hold up and then it gets reported uh, and then they're more aware of it. Whereas at off peak times, it's gonna take more time before it's realized. Pedestrians in a live lane, yeah. If the advice is to get out of the car and hide behind the barrier, the, for a period of time anyway, there will be pedestrians in a live motorway lane. And the final one we talked about, I just mentioned before, was vehicles exiting the emergency refuge area. How on earth do you do that safely? And these were acknowledged in an official report. Now, at the beginning of the year, January, February, there's quite a bit in the press about this. It's sort of been superseded by COVID somewhat, but 
it there were a number of different reports it seemed to be that it suddenly came to the fore in january february um that one was uh showing smart motorways make traffic jams worse because you'll end up closing more lanes to to rescue people daily mail bbc 38 killed on smart motorways in the last five years um the times more serious crashes on smart motorways uh, Telegraph, Highways England accused of failing to consider perils of disabled people. How on earth do you get out of your vehicle and so on if you've got problems with that? Even their own report, this is something called a Pope, not that Pope. Uh, this is a uh, post-operational something evaluation. I forgot what the P was there for. But this, I won't read through the whole thing, but this was provided by Highways England about the bit of the smart motorway as you come around Birmingham that show that actually overall, the number of collisions was slightly worse than it had been before the, the scheme was implemented. Actually slightly fewer deaths, but the, there hadn't been that many. So it was mute point whether it's statistically valid. And I've taken some information from this. I'd really recommend there's a Panorama, BBC Panorama program. It's still on iPlayer. Uh, half an hour long it's quite dramatic it's worth watching that um that goes into it so a lot of bad press lately and it questions some of the official guidance and so on with this particularly with breakdowns on the motorway the government response to this was to now well they announced an inquiry what they came up with was this they called it a smart motorways evidence stock take and action plan now, what's the difference between a stock take and an inquiry? Well, a stock take is you gather together all the information you've already published in one document, 78 pages of it, uh, which shows you all sorts of statistics and so on. It is fairly un impenetrable, to be honest. I, I, some of it's interesting. But out of that, they come, came up with an 18-point plan. Now, as with all government announcements, some of these things had been announced already and were ongoing, but that's, that's inevitable, that's how it works. These were the sorts of things, I'm not gonna go through every single one, I will highlight one or two. One, they said they're going to abolish dynamic hard shoulders, but by 2025, so don't quite hold your breath just yet. Uh, they are gonna go. Speeding up the deployment of stopped vehicle detection, uh, install the technology within three years. So don't hold your breath on that one just yet. Um, faster attendance by the highway agency, aim for an average response down from 17 to 10 minutes. So you only got to wait in that live running lane, stationary, for 10 minutes. Um, reducing the distance between places to stop in an emergency to three quarters of a mile. So that's how far you've got to coast into your, your lay-by if you've broken down. Now, I'll come back to those in a moment. The maximum would be one mile. I tried clocking this actually on the M1, driving now, because I've been looking at this the last couple of weeks. Driving down the M1 yesterday, I started measuring some of them, and a lot of them were in the limit, but quite a few were longer than a mile. Um, I won't go through all of them. Well, I will I draw your attention. They're now going to be paint the lay-by thingies, the ERAs are now going to be paint, painted bright orange so that you've got no excuse for not seeing it. Uh, and various other ones. <clears throat> However, I won't go through all of those. But the bottom line, the conclusion, the main conclusion was that uh, Smart motorways are as safe or as safer than conventional ones, but not in every way. Statistics show that fatal casualty rates are lower, while injury rates are slightly higher. And, and so it says that's what we're going to do. So its conclusion is actually they're reasonably safe. So what's the advice if you're driving on one? The official advice, oh, well, that's a solid cross. More about the broken cross later. Official advice is this. If your vehicle has a problem on the motorway with no hard shoulder, move into the left-hand lane, so you're still driving at this point, the car's still moving, move into the left-hand lane and put your hazard lights on. Exit at the next junction or services, or 
follow the orange SOS signs to an emergency area and call for help using the free telephone. Now, free telephone obviously locates precisely where you are and it's painted on the side of it. So there are some advantages to using the emergency telephone in those laybys. So that's the first thing, if you can get into the layby. If you can't get off the motorway, it says, move your vehicle as close as possible to the left-hand verge, boundary or slip road. If you feel you can get out safely with any occupants, consider exiting your vehicle via the left-hand door and wait behind the safety barrier. Uh, and if there, is a, if there is one, and it's safe to do so, don't try this on the raised portions of the uh, smart motorway going through Birmingham, because it's a hell of a drop the other side. Keep clear of your vehicle moving traffic at all times. Call 999 immediately. I put that top of the list actually. Now, there's always been a possibility of breaking down in some lane other than lane one. And you've got four to choose now, well, three others to choose from now. So what happens if you break down somewhere else, some other lane? So the advice now is keep your seatbelt on and hazard lights on and call 999 immediately. We'll close the lane and send help. Right. I'm going to play a sound clip now. Uh, last time I did this, I couldn't hear it, but you could. So if it works the other way around, please tell me you're not hearing anything in a second. But just listen to this. This is a real 999 call. And I want you to kind of mentally tick off which of these points they've, they've done. Have they uh, obeyed the instructions? My car's broken down. Okay, whereabouts on the end? I'm, I'm on the left hand lane. Um, I've passed Nutsford. Um, I don't have a, uh, a bearing, I'm afraid. Okay, um, are you going north or southbound? I'm going northbound. Got the hazards on. Uh, what else can I do? Because um, I've got a family of five in the car. Okay, don't bad. worry. And you say there's five people in the car? Yeah, my. my oh, shit. That's quite chilling, isn't it? Hello. That's quite chilling, isn't it? Um, I was, for my, they were all right. There were minor injuries, I should say. So, this is why this red light business and closing lanes is so phenomenally important, and the law was changed. Well, it was always been illegal to go past one of these red lights and one of the closed lanes, but the law was changed a few years ago that the cameras that are there to detect speed and to monitor the traffic can now be used to enforce these. So anybody going past one of these is likely to receive a ticket, 100 pound fine, fixed penalty, three points. But one, it's there to protect stranded vehicles, anybody stuck in those lanes. And it also creates an access route for emergency services to get to people. As I say, it's illegal. It's Road Traffic Act Section 36. Now, just if you're anarchically interested in that, that's the same one as jumping a red light. Um, of course, bizarrely, it's different if the red light happens, red cross rather, happens to be over a dynamic hard shoulder, in which case it's a different motorway regulation. Piece of useless information, you might think. And 2016, the law changed to allow camera evidence for those offences. So people doing that will be prosecuted. But have a look at this. This is the diagram I showed you before and all the features of a smart motorway. Those emergency areas should be every 600 meters, every three quarters of a mile or something like this, at least no more than every mile. Some of them are at least two and a half miles apart at the moment. And some of them will be changed, but they are a long way apart. Average response times. The time to be spotted by the cameras alone, on average, is 17 minutes because that's before they've done anything. That's because they've got 
handful of, I don't say a handful of people, they've got big control rooms, but an awful lot of cameras to monitor. And although there is software and technology that tries to detect something stationary, it hasn't always been rolled out, it doesn't always work. So 17 minutes on average, so sometimes it's longer, just to be spotted. There's a protocol to follow to close off a lane, not unreasonably, because you can't do it willy-nilly. The police could be doing it, the traffic, uh, the um, highways England could be doing it. It's got to go through a central control room and so on. So on average, three minutes to actually go through that process and close a lane. And then when they dispatch a traffic officer to attend, to actually do, do something and, and clear it, the response time is on average 17 minutes. And it's that time that they're trying to bring down to 10. But if you add those up, we're already over half an hour on average. This is why phoning and letting them know 999 as soon as you break down is so important. Now, what about the breakdown services? Well, they can't mend your tire in lane, whichever it is, three or four of a, of a high speed motorway. They can't attend any of those in a fast running lane. They will not attend in a live running lane. They will wait till the highway agency or highways England have moved you into a service station or into a lay by, and then they will fix it. Um, and finally, those, this new super duper radar that can detect objects and stationary vehicles, well, that, they're only on the M25 at the moment. Uh, they don't exist elsewhere. I think they're starting to roll them out on the M3 and the rest of us will get them over the next three years, hopefully. So there's a lot of worrying features about this. So I would suggest this is my invention, but what advice should we be giving to people about them? Well, one, don't break down. Uh, I know that's easily said, but it becomes doubly important to do those powder checks, check the car over, particularly the common things that people break down through lack of fuel or a problem with tires. Or at the first hint of any issue, you know, some warning light or anything, however minor, get off the motorway, check it over, top up water, whatever you need to do, but think about taking another route because all of a sudden a breakdown could become very, very serious. Maximize your chance of getting into one of these ERAs. Start taking note of the signs that tell you how far it is to an ERA. Get into lane one as soon as safely possible if you have any sort of incident. And contrary to what we might have said before, have a charged mobile phone to hand. Ideally hands-free, and sudden new cars have an SOS button that either links to the phone or has its own device that will kind of call the emergency services on your behalf with your location. Uh, mine doesn't, I haven't experienced that, but I know some cars do. So it's worth knowing how that works and if you have such a thing. Observation, part of that was observation, but know where you are. Now, for ages that we've had those little posts that like this, they have a location, they tell you where you are on the motorway. Additionally, because a lot of people use their mobile phones, we have these bigger signs. So that's saying, I'm on the M27, I'm on the B carriageway. One direction will be A, one will be B. The A direction, the numbers are increasing. So if you're on the M1 near us going away from London, the numbers are increasing, so you're on the A side. If you're going the other way towards London, you'll be on the B side, uh, numbers decreasing. But the number underneath it is how many kilometers from, a, from the start of the motorway or from some location. So that gives a fairly precise indication of where you are. So if you can't see the little ones like that, look out for those and report that on your mobile phone. Or if you're reporting somebody else breaking down, you can say it's just near this marker post. And that will give a fairly precise one. The, mo the SOS phones also have, uh, although they know where they are, they also have location markers on them too. Have a look at this. You're following along. Um, 
on uh, ordinary road, nice clear day, dry road, bright, lit, everything good. And um, what, say about two second gap? I don't know, there's a van up front. Have a look at this. I'll have a look at that in a moment. Let me just sort out my laser pen. Have a look at this. How's that for a near miss? Let's see that again. Now I'd say it's hard to say on video how far apart they are, but the car we're in is a pretty damn near miss. Not, and the van was just amazing that they missed them at all. But it's that, um, it's that idea that you really need to leave a long gap. You know, two seconds almost isn't enough there. You need about four or something. You've kind of got to assume that there is a stationary object in the lane ahead of you. The other concern people raised was access by emergency services. So a brief look at that. How on earth do they get to you if there isn't a hard shoulder? Now, it's all very well if the traffic is moving. Um, I. I take most of this advice from the back bit of the uh, of road craft that we don't normally use. Uh, and I know there's one or two policemen, the next policeman on the call, they could probably give me more information. But basically, the guidance generally for emergency vehicles is to use the outside lane if you can, if things are moving. If it's slow or stationary, they will try and squeeze up um, one or other of these gaps up here, which obviously is slow as traffic spots them and moves out of the way. Now, this is important. If you see this sort of thing, do look out for emergency vehicles uh, coming this way and move out of the way because not it should be, but not all of it is spotted by the cameras. If they get an indication that there's some holdup, the first thing they do is change the warning signs to say report of obstruction in the road. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's some object that's fallen from a car. It could be a broken down car. So they seek to verify what's going on, what's the actual problem. And when they work out that actually it's a, a broken down vehicle or an accident or something, then the next thing that happens is they will switch the, the signs, but they have to verify it. And sometimes it has to be a person that verifies it if they haven't got sight of it with the cameras which obviously takes some time. So the next thing that they will do, once they've verified what the nature of it is, is to switch these signs. So in order to get access, they need to close a lane, but the gantry signs before that will indicate that you've got to leave that lane and the speed limit. And it will bring down the speed first to 60, telling you that there's a lane closure ahead. Then they will start to close that lane so there'll be gantry signs showing you to come into the next lane and finally they'll close the lane. Which lane they close depends on the nature of the incident. It, typically it's lane one or it's lane four but it doesn't have to be, it depends exactly what the situation is. In very serious cases and once they verify there's no traffic flowing they can after closing it completely, get access from the other direction. So the emergency vehicles join at one junction on, go backwards up the motorway, deal with the incident and go around that way. But they've got to have made sure, there's usually somebody has had to come here and close it all first and make sure that there's no vehicle sneaking through or anything before that. And that's kind of how they get to you. So what I'm laboring here is the importance of those red signs, I think, the red crosses. The other point I made was people's worry about leaving the ERAs because once you're in that lay-by, all very well, you repair your tyre or something or the nice RAC man fixes whatever he fixes and it's all right, you're good to go. Now, if you have that sort of thing, usually the advice to the repair people, to the uh, uh, recovery people, is to once they're done, use the roadside phone and phone the control center 
and then they should switch off that lane. They should put a red cross over that lane, close it to traffic, and that lets you get out, pick up speed and continue in that lane until you're the next gantry. The next gantry should be back to normal again after the, the incident. Um, so if the repairman doesn't do it, ask for help on the emergency phone to get out. That's the advice to the, the emergency people. So I rec suggest that's what you should do as well if they're not there to do it for you. And then you wait because it's going to take a, t a certain amount of time for them to one, close the lane and B, they check out the, on their cameras that everything is safe to, to go. So it may take a while before they actually do that. And as I say, they should close them. There's no guarantee of all of these things. That's me done. I've used quite a lot of the time, but I'm still left with the broken, the mystery of the broken red cross. So we said, sometimes you've got a dynamic hard shoulder and sometimes you haven't. But actually, if you've been using this dynamic hard shoulder, if they just switch it off like this, do you know, the human brain doesn't always spot the fact that something is now missing, like the, the speed limit I had before is now gone. So what they had originally was a brilliant idea that we'll have some sort of warning that says, this was dynamic a minute ago, this was running a minute ago, but it's just changed, just as a kind of visual reminder. And those of you uh, as anoraki as I have been over the last couple of weeks, there is a piece of secondary legislation that covers the use of all the road signs. It's in multiple manuals. It was originally the previous update, I'll, you know, I can't remember, I think it was 2002. And in something like 2015, there was a one paragraph update that said, just for this purpose, we'll have this sign across that means we've just, this section of the dynamic hard shoulder has just switched back to being a hard shoulder again. It means this is a hard shoulder. Whereas this one, the solid, would mean that this is a running lane, but it's closed because of an emergency like we just talked about. So there's this subtle difference between the little red cross. Now, that's all very well. And uh, somebody told me about this and I sort of researched it and they were right. However, the new regulations came out in 2016. No mention of it. Absolutely no mention of it. Actually, it does mention them. It says there's two sorts of crosses and they're exactly equal in their value. In other words, like this, you can't continue that. It's a closed lane. And I, so we had, I, I was going to open a competition at this point to see if anybody could spot one of these on their journeys. And do you know what? Yesterday, coming back from London, I spotted one on the M1, just after Luton and before you get to Milton Keynes. How exciting is that? Okay, uh, not that exciting, but it is if you spent two weeks sort of discussing the various and the different, um, how it arose and so on. So enough of me going on about the, the mystery of the road. I was going to encourage you to spot one. And now, whenever you're traveling up and down the motorway, see if you can spot one of these broken crosses as opposed to the bog standard one like that. Anyway, enough of me rambling. Quick summary, for goodness sake, don't break down. It can be extremely dangerous. If you do, phone 999 immediately, as soon as absolutely possible. As you're traveling along, leave a massive gap. Forget the two seconds, make it four or longer. Assume there's a stationary vehicle in your lane and look out for anybody doing weird and wonderful uh, uh, maneuvers to avoid something that looks stationary. Up your observation, start noticing those emergency refuge areas and the signs that Easy, warn you of them. And finally, don't forget to look out for the endangered species, the broken red cross. That's me done. So I'm gonna open this up for any questions, any discussion. I'm gonna stop sharing that screen and so I can see all you.